So before we jump into conversation on planar hopping, I want to know if there's any fictional reality you'd like to visit for a week. I I immediately have an answer, but <laughs> it's it's yours, Lord of the Rings. It's uh, it would have been maybe like five to ten years ago. Yes, absolutely. All right, what's your answer? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like, do I go first or do I go last? <laughs> you go whenever your heart desires. Uh, <laughs> I am in the throes of the era of um, like romanticy books. And so my, my immediate answer is Valaris, which is a location in the Akatar series. So that's where I want to go if I could go for a week. This means absolutely nothing to me, but I'll take your word for it. It sounds... <laughs> Good, great for you. <laughs> Somebody will know that. Somebody right. out there, a whole bunch of people be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, for me, right now, I'm watching House of the Dragon, so uh, Game of Thrones universe. Um, you would not do well there. That, I'm calling bullshit on that right now. You want to go to Bridgerton. I'm <laughs> on to you. All right, fine, man. Bridgerton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bridgerton, yes. <laughs> yes, the Bridgerton universe. That's where I. That's where I need to be. <laughs> I love how you went from Game of Thrones. Okay, no Bridgerton. <laughs> like, <laughs> can you imagine me trying to like win the Iron Throne? I would number one get bored. <laughs> number two, just be like, y'all are doing too much for me. So, yeah, Bridgerton. Adam's correct. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'd probably go to star trek because there's no capitalism it's, it's a utopia you you could do whatever you want you like open your own restaurant just because you love food or just be an artist or like own a vineyard just because you don't even sell your wares you do it for the bash that sounds ideal i would just love to not worry about money yeah that would be nice and also you've got like you could travel anywhere in the snap of a finger. Like you've got the ability to just make an entire seven course meal in under a minute. Like I'm just, I'm all about it. It sounds great to me. Okay. That's like a dream. Yes. All of the things. I honestly can't think of too many other like utopias that are actually good. They're always like a utopia with a dark underbelly to the world. Oh, yeah. Like, there's some sort of like generational war that's about to happen or like there's going to be some sort of um, like catastrophic event looming. <laughs> yeah. That is like, this is incredibly wonderful and I'm happy every day, but I know that that volcano is going to erupt and kill us all one day soon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the It's a Mimic podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another It's a Mimic episode, where we continue our conversation on lore in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. I'm Adam, and with me today are Casey and Mieka, and this episode is called Sigil and the Outlands, Specific Generalities and Terrific Abnormalities. In... This episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, this panel of Dungeon Masters will visit potentially the last campaign setting published in 5th edition before 1 D&D is released. Before we jump into this, I want to ask, how familiar was everyone with Planescape before this episode? Let's roll initiative for this one. I got to two. Seven. Eighteen. Yeah, I mean, I can okay. answer, answer yourself. Talk to yourself. You're good. Uh, I, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> um, so I am completely new to what this is. Um, and maybe I have heard about it, like, you know, in passing, but I don't know. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know anything about this place. <laughs> well, I'm the same. I didn't know anything about it. I'm assuming potentially adam you might have thrown a couple things about this in a campaign at one time or another that is the only way i would probably even know anything mm -hmm. <laughs> we are in a black hole right now yeah <laughs> all right i am legitimately excited for this episode with you two specifically because i think that honestly when it comes to the podcast only me and Tyler and maybe Dan. I don't like not even Dave knows much about Planescape. It's just not something that we ever really 
delved into because it was kind of a late AD and D um, and 3.5 thing. But in 3.5, we were all Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Eberron. We didn't really play in Planescape. So I remember reading the campaign setting book that 3.5 gave us years ago. But that was, I'm not kidding, 21 years ago, maybe. So I, I was only vaguely familiar with it. I understand the concept of it, but the details were lost to me. So going through and digging into the box set that came out, because we did the legend lore a while back, uh, I was thoroughly unimpressed with what the box set had to offer. The adventure seems cool. The monster, I'm always glad to get more monsters. But the breakdown itself, while it's better than the Spelljammer campaign setting, there's not a whole lot of info. There really isn't. There's little bits and pieces of information here and there, but but there's, there's not much. So um, I'm, I'm glad that I got the opportunity to do the research for this and to dig into it so that we can spend some time kind of digging into the details. And we're going to get into kind of the overall feeling today, as well as the the nitty gritty bits and pieces. I think that Planescape, the campaign setting, was done dirty in fifth edition. You're not going to learn much about it except for what a uh, like 60 page, 80 page, something like that book has to offer. And that's it. Um, it was so much more fleshed out, so better fleshed out like in previous editions. Um, but I'm excited to kind of dig into the beginning of it. I'd love to get your guys' opinions coming in fresh because I didn't want Dan or Tyler or brad who would do the research ahead of time or anybody to come in already thinking what it should be i'm curious to see how you guys feel about what it is now um but before we jump any further into this i want to head into a quick info break we've previously covered quite a bit in our discussion on player options in fifth edition for all those episodes and more you can follow or subscribe on spotify apple podcasts youtube and dozens of other podcast apps if you'd like to support us, you can donate through the website, check out our store, or join our Patreon and get access to other episodes and series. If you'd like to pay for some ad space on It's a Mimic, or just send a shout out to a friend, please reach out to us through our email and website that are listed in the show notes below. This is a full week on the It's a Mimic channels. Yesterday, we kicked off with touring the multiverse where Mieke and Casey covered three of the Theros gods who were concerned with civilizations. Tomorrow is another full episode of the regular show, which is going to look beyond the stars to some truly nasty enemies. Then Dan and Brad return to Patreon to continue their discussion on the Critical Role books, this time focusing on the Call of the Netherdeep, and, assuming the international shipping will ever sort itself out, Dan and I will round out the week by cracking open quests from the Infinite Staircase for the first time on the public channels. But for now, let's get back to the episode. Okay, so Planescape is the name of the campaign setting. That's not actually a place you can go. It's just like the Forgotten Realms is not a place you can go either. You go to the world of Toril, um, and then you head to Faerun, or you go to the Sword Coast, right? These are actual physical locations, but you can't go to the Forgotten Realms. It's not like Greyhawk, which is... Um, I guess Greyhawk is the same way, actually, because you, the main world is Orth. But, like, we get that a lot in D&D, where it's a little bit different than other kind of intellectual properties, which give you a concept that, like... When you don't, when you do Game of Thrones, you go to Westeros, right? And people talk about Westeros as the place. Um, the place that we visit in Planescape, there's many places, but the main ones are either Sigil or the Outlands. And yes, it's pronounced Sigil. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, this is something that I learned like earlier this week, and I've been calling it Sigil for years, but apparently that's wrong. So, anyways, a little background on Planescape. And this is kind of where all of my annoyance will start to seep in. Planescape was first published in 1994, having been designed and created by Zeb Cook. And it was supposed to connect all of the great wheel cosmology, which is based on alignments and also offer connections to other campaign settings. So player characters can jump around through different worlds. Mieka, are you familiar with the great wheel cosmology? No, <laughs> I'm not. Casey, you're shaking your head, but you absolutely are because it's what it's called when you go to all of the other planes of existence, like the Feywild, the Plane of Fire, the Abyss, the Nine Hells, Mount Celestia. Um, oh, okay. 
Yeah. So I just the, didn't know it had a term. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the great wheel is at the very middle of it is um, the material plane, and that's where all of D and D happens. Like that's your Forgotten Realms. Your where where you would play your average campaign in Baldur's Gate or Waterdeep or wherever. Oh, and yeah, then there are the inner planes, which are all the know. elemental planes around it. There are the mirror planes, which is the Feywild and the Shadowfell, which, and kind of the ethereal plane, which are kind of dark or bright mirrors of the material plane. There's the astral sea between all of the different planes, kind of hovers over it all. And then there are all of the alignment planes, so where you have like lawful good, um, and then you have um, like lawful good slash neutral good, and then neutral good, and then neutral good slash chaotic good, and then chaotic good. And each one has a plane. Every one of the planes has multiple levels of existence on it. Um, I think I think there's one or two that only has one level, but that's why we have the nine hells. There are nine levels of existence. And the abyss has an infinite number of levels of uh, of existence, but they all have the same basic themes that are based on the alignment that they're uh, attached to. This is just about the only thing that is important to alignments anymore as we're getting further and further away from having it matter. In previous editions, you couldn't be a paladin unless you were lawful, um, and, and you couldn't be a monk unless you were lawful. Was or was the monk neutral? I can't remember now. There were like there were these alignment restrictions that you, that you would have on your characters even to be able to do anything, and you would often end up with conversations around the table like, "Well, hold on, you're chaotic neutral. Why are you acting like this? Or you are lawful evil. You can't give someone else a health potion. Shit like that, right? So as they as they have abandoned that, they've also started to abandon it for monsters as well. Whereas normally the alignment would kind of give you an idea about how the monster would act in certain situations. Now they're removing it to say it's typically lawful evil or typically chaotic good or typically unaligned. There are going to be outliers and they're just kind of like acknowledging that now. But the Great Wheel cosmology, the way that the planes are laid, are laid out in the Forgotten Realms specifically, is still based on alignment. And planescape really 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 relies on that so it uh it says that at the center of the planar crossroads sits a city named sigil or sorry sigil not sigil apparently they wanted it to be a different pronunciation than if you were to draw sigils like a wizard drawing it on their, their like chamber floor or whatever right but uh but they kept the same spelling so that just drives me off the wall sigil yeah, like thanks for that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, new game for this episode. Every time I pronounce it wrong, you have to take a shot. So this is for all the listeners out there. Um, I hope you're not driving. Can I uh, be included in like pronouncing it wrong? Because I absolutely will too. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if any of us pronounce it wrong. <laughs> um, okay. So Sigil was run um, by different extreme factions in the past. But that exploded in a conflict called the Faction War in an adventure actually called Faction War. And now none of those factions truly exist to the same degree that they did before. So what can you expect? Well, this was promoted to newcomers as D&D's answer to the idea of the multiverse that's saturating pop culture right now. But while this seems like it's a ripoff of Rick and Morty or Loki or the absolute train wreck of the Terminator series, whatever the fuck is happening in comic books this month, it really is not a ripoff for two reasons. One, with the exception of the comic books, this came first. Planescape has been around longer than, than this idea of the multiverse. But second, it's not really the multiverse, and it's really just a setting based on plane hopping. At least this version is. There are little bits and pieces, little hints in the writing that there are alternate realities of things, but that never really comes up, not at all in this version of Planescape. Um, I, it comes up a little bit in the adventure that was published with it. However, this will, we won't touch on like alternate versions of the same person or anything like that at all in this episode. So yes, Wizards of the Coast probably revisited the idea and rushed it out the door for the same reason that the poorly thought out Flash movie limped into existence, money. And yes, the final product under-delivered with an insultingly high price tag. But that doesn't mean that the campaign setting itself is bad. So I am going to try to defend that in this episode, even though 
the book is pretty shit. So let's look at the intro from 5th edition's poorly titled Adventures in the Multiverse. First of all, it promises an infinite amount of storylines and an infinite amount of realities, but that's not at all what was delivered. We're still just dealing with the Great Wheel cosmology in 5th ed. If you want to head to the alternate reality where you, Casey, marry Jason Momoa, uh, 5th edition does not offer that reality. Not really. Um, but it does give you the ability to travel to Elysium or Limbo or Hades or Acheron. And it gives you a pretty neat city with some unique features and some insight into the treks you'll make back and forth between the planes. So yes to planar hopping, no to alternate realities, mostly. Planescape also offers what they call the three truths, and each is less sensical than the last, and I fucking hate this. was a waste of, of printing ink. I'm just annoyed. The first is that despite the fact that Sigil is considered the center of the multiverse, it states outright there is no central hub to the multiverse. It's apparently infinite, and that means that there can be no center to it. Therefore, the only center of the multiverse that matters is you, because everything else in your life revolves around you. And I find this quaint bullshit absolutely fucking annoying, as it, it kind of spits in the face of the fact that there absolutely can be a center point of infinity. But I'm not going to go off about physics right now. I just want you to know that this pissed me off to a great fucking deal. Miek is on mute right now, but she's killing herself <laughs> laughing because I'm like, like peak rage right now, and she can sense it. So... Noted. <laughs> <laughs> the second truth, that's just the first one, fuck. The second truth is that everything is made of infinite rings. Some physical, some metaphysical, but if you follow any cycle, orbit, system, or whatever long enough, you'll end up where you started. This does not help me as a dungeon master, and it certainly doesn't help you as a player, and I don't know what the fuck this is supposed to mean. So I think the idea is that all life is on a great big cycle and... Sure, that's fine. I can't follow a cyclical ring. Would like if I move across the country, I'm not gonna fuck. I'm just I'm this it annoys me. It fucking annoys me. So and the third truth is that Casey, you're gonna love this as a scientist. Is that for every action, somewhere in the multiverse in the multiverse, there are two partnering reactions. Not an equal and opposite reaction, just two other things that happened somewhere else in the multiverse. Casey, you look horrified. <laughs> Like, okay okay i can't i can't be on board <laughs> <laughs> so it does say though usually this doesn't matter will it affect you but sometimes it's all that matters <laughs> Why it's like, they're trying to make it extra dramatic but then they also are making no sense whatsoever it's like you have to ignore the actual rules of physics for this book because we're just doing whatever the fuck we want instead but then we also want you to be invested and enthralled so that you are like oh okay two okay <laughs> it, you are the center of the universe <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> You're, you're the center of the universe. Everything you do matters and doesn't matter. The, the center of the universe is everywhere and nowhere. It's all things and nothing. But if you follow those rings of your life, you'll end up back to where you were. The fuck you And if you about? do one thing, there's going to be two reactions you may or may not know about. It could be everything to you or nothing to you. But, you know. <laughs> so all of this wraps up to say, that the multiverse is more clearly and cleanly described in Fizban's Treasury of Dragons about like the alternate versions of dragons being aware of themselves and things. And I kind of hate what this has become, which is just <sighs> this really feels like a ninth grader trying to sound deep, mm. right? And yeah. and it it reeks of amateur hour, and I just fucking hate it. So but that is what fifth edition has kind of like lumped on top of with no more explanation that none of this will ever come up again. So it, it talks about like things tend to happen in threes that will not come up again. We, we will not interact with that. As a matter of fact, there are 16 planes, which is not even divisible by three. So like this does not fucking matter at all. And we can move past it. Um, and then after that is an, uh, the chapter one, which is on character options, which includes backgrounds, feats, magical items, and spells, but we're going to skip over that. That's not what this episode is about. What this episode is about is asking your opinion on shit. So let's grab D20s, because I have questions. 
four. I got a six. I got a 20. Ooh. Okay. What? I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I Is know. that your first 20 on a regular episode, Mianka? I think so. It might be. Well, this is great. I will start by asking you, are we sick of multiverse stories yet? Uh, I know I am. Uh, I feel like, you know, after watching like the Avengers and stuff like that, they did it very well. And I feel like everything after that was just trying to live up to, we can write a great multiverse story too. <laughs> I'm kind of over it. And I think we just need to write, I'm ready for the next engaging story that doesn't have to deal with multiverse timelines and situations and stuff um yeah I'm, I'm kind of over it i'm kind of over it i am a big fan of the multiverse if done appropriately like alternate realities i actually like rick and morty i really like loki i loved comic books when they were dealing with all of that crazy multiversal shit um back in like the new 52 and infinite crisis and all that shit i like the mirror universe and star trek I like Back to the Future, which is about an alternate timeline that has to get rewritten over and over again. I don't I don't mind this shit. When it comes to time travel and alternate dimensions and shit like that, I'm cool with it. But this is bad, and I don't need it in my D&D, right? That's not what this is about. And trying to keep track of it. Uh, Casey, it's been a while, but I played a little bit with time travel in our D&D campaign, and it was so complicated and so convoluted that um, you guys just kind of gave up through your hands in the air and trusted me that I was tracking it. And yeah. then it paid off in little ways, but I would hazard to say that it's really not worth the headache. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with it is um, I love the complicated storylines for entertainment when you're watching a series and or watching a movie that has this. And I like those spins. Yeah. But um I don't mind I don't mind it in D D when it offers you kind of the ability to mix something up by, you know, transporting you to another place and having a side adventure there that's just like a one shot or something that is key to the long term story, but just doesn't fit with where you are in your campaign. And so it gives you that opportunity to go somewhere else or go back in time because you royally fuck something up and now you have to actually ultimately go fix that and mm -hmm. so you have to figure out a way to do that there's little like spins that I can appreciate but when it comes to like what we were doing in the campaign especially like it went so far like in a like when dealing with everything else in the campaign we did you dirty, Adam, on that because we we couldn't track, we couldn't figure it out. We were, I ultimately was relying on Dan to like invest the time to understand it because I'm like, I am lost. I don't know. I'm just going to ask Dan when the time comes. And so it is an angle, but I think unless you have a really good experienced DM that can clearly like track it themselves and try and like keep it rolling the players will have a hard time unless there's one person that's just so invested in it otherwise it gets lost and it's less important than a whole bunch of other things it, and it makes it worse when you're dealing with multiple versions of the same character at one point we had our gnome wizard Roywin was that we had multiple versions existing an elderly version which was against you guys and a current version which was on your side and there was at one point we had a couple of Rezus walking around because he, he was fucking around with time. And so there was different versions of him in the same space or he was like suddenly blinking out of existence and coming back. So there were no Rezus or two Rezus or three Rezus. There was a lot going on and it was neat. It was complicated, but these were a little taste. It was like for one session here and one session there. If that had been the whole thing, I think it would have been too much. So I'm, yeah. am I sick of multiverse stories? Yeah, I'm sick of bad ones and everyone's doing that now. I'm all for good ones as escapist narrative, right? I don't need it in my tabletop role-playing games. It looks like we're never going to get a proper in-depth breakdown of the planes in 5th edition. In the Dungeon Master's Guide, each plane gets, I'm not joking, maybe three paragraphs. Maybe. For the entire plane of existence. And then, with the exception of the Feywild and the Shadowfell, and the astral plane we don't get much more than that 
And even for those, we don't get a whole lot more. We get little like demi planes and and general vague details and shit about it, right? So we don't have a lot on planes, and it looks like we never will. Mika, do you think that we need it in in fifth edition? Is it is it a missing gap? Do you feel like we need more? I mean, I'm kind of in the middle because I because I'm a big believer in like as a, if you you know DMing a D and D campaign, you should make it what you want it to be all within reason you know and within reason and based on people's comfortability um but then there's a part of me that like i feel in D D, we need those breakdowns so stuff is clear and we we're, we'll be able to like explain it better so i'm gonna say like yeah <laughs> my answer is yes and no <laughs> i'm like right in the middle um hmm. i don't really have a definitive answer See, I very much have a definitive answer, of course, because I'm a big lore nerd and I want more. But in all reality, 5th edition, Dungeons and Dragons, but specifically 5th edition, has been all about you taking the pieces that you like from what they provide and making your own story. As we're moving forward into the next edition, there's talk about making everything setting agnostic, which is to say... All goblins everywhere act like this. And if you want anything more specific, you need to buy that campaign book, that setting there. And so it's not going to be set like everything we have for 5th edition is in the Forgotten Realms, it's like this, right? And all of our adventures are in the Forgotten Realms. And so all of the cookie cutter monsters are for the Forgotten Realms. The Monster Manual is a Forgotten Realms book with the with a couple of minor exceptions. But like there are there are rumblings of going setting agnostic and that's all well and good and that's fine but you have to give us the fucking tools to build our things because i've got 20 plus years experience dming nobody else does like dan does but that guy doesn't count on the best of days so (laughs) so there are there need to be tools that we can use and there are people that love planescape there are people that love Spelljammer and eberron and and want to and they want to play in there and getting one book of poorly defined answers is not enough and i don't know if they're just relying on our ability to google or if they're relying on our ability to go to dm's guild and buy the old um materials and get that printed at an exorbitant cost but like the the info's out there for people if they want to find it but wizards is not investing in it anymore and i I think they really fucking need to i agree i think it's worth outlining and having because I'm also someone that's a bit more like I'm a I'm a data driven person and so I would like to be able to answer questions about this if my players bring it up and be like oh well let me look it up just like many other things it's like I would like to try and do this sure there's a mechanic for that let's look it up because I haven't seen that before same with this people start asking about this like what's the history or where why are things this way and I don't know because lots of things I don't know then I can't like unless I know where to find this it's gonna be a very obscure and vague well depending on where you look and which book you're in this is what it says here so I would love to have something like this where it's like okay if you're going to the concrete lore here's how it is and then it can spin off from there. So I say, uh, yes, we need it. Look, Planescape, Spelljammer, Eberron, and Greyhawk are all legacy settings that each got one book dedicated to them. Ravnica, Theros, and Strixhaven are all new settings to D&D and got comparable spotlights. But with one D&D, or they're, co- they're calling it 5.24 online because it comes out in 2024, and that is such a fucking mouthful that I hate it, and we need to do better as a community. But with one D and D trying to go setting agnostic, Mia, could you feel like we need more info and more books for each one of these settings, or should we get more settings, more vague, shallow settings? I would focus on Ravnica because that's probably like one of the what most popular settings. It's only it's only the most popular in our circle. I don't think the majority of D and D. I just fucking love it so. <laughs> Um, but Theros needs to get, you know, I would like to see Theros expanded, but, and Eberron too. But other than that, like, let's bring in new settings. Like, I would like to see new worlds develop, but that's just me because I like to, you know, new stories, new worlds, new settings and stuff. Mm-hmm. 
um, I would like for them to keep going with that. I think it works, but like, like I think you said, said Adam, like be specific and be better about like your editing skills <laughs> for like, you know, in the books and stuff. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> like we've got five legacy campaign settings and three new ones, although I don't give a fuck about Strixhaven. Neat ideas in it, really cool ideas in it. But I don't give a fuck about the setting. It's a magical college. I don't give a shit. So let's say seven that I care about. There are seven settings. One book each. Give give me give me another book on each one of them. Like every year, just release one additional campaign setting book that fleshes out something else. And yeah, they give us new stuff too if you want. But like, there are people that want more, and it and your still Wizard of the Coast sales are not not going to be accurate about the amount of want and need in D&D, right? So um, it's bizarre to me that we've got 400 fucking Forgotten Realms books and then one Eberron, one Greyhawk book. And the Greyhawk book is about one little coastal city and the adventures in it. It has nothing to do with like the kingdoms and the pantheon and everything else of Greyhawk, which is very well established and developed. Nothing, nothing. So I want more. Yeah, I think that's the way sh they should do it because the the legacy players want to see more in the areas that they know and the place and the like the build on the lore that they have and they want more. And then they also would be happy to see and judge new stuff that they bring up. So do both. But like I think it would be a shame not to have add-ons from the existing stuff and then um only focus on like let's just make brand new stuff we've did we've been there done that it's like yeah you did in certain aspects but not in a lot of the ways we just described so do that too i really wish that we would have something like uh like 2026 is the year of eberron for example and so every month there's a 25 page soft cover like magazine almost that focuses on, on one aspect like the politics of or the noble houses of or the the whatever their version of the of hell is right like and, and you get different different focuses on it and so if you're an Eberron person you're buying these at six bucks a piece you're that there's gonna make as much money as they did on a hardcover no problem and people, some people will just say, oh, hey, that one's about the monsters or that one has feats or that one. And they'll buy it because they won't buy an 84 page or page uh, or an $84 300 page book. Right. Like there's ways to do this. And I don't know why Wizards of the Coast aren't looking at like the subscription. But anyway, that's not all what this episode is about. I'm ranting now. OK, <laughs> so moving on, let's go back to Sigil. Sigil, take a shot. <laughs> I can guarantee I know which patrons are actually taking a shot right now. Like the, the, it's it's going to be good. <laughs> Scott, I'm looking at you. Um, Sigil is known as the City of Doors. It is definitively at the center of the Great Wheel cosmology, despite the shit earlier about how there is no center. It is definitively at the center of the hub of the crossroads in the middle of the of the Great Wheel. But it also has portals to every other plane of existence within it. Now, while this sounds like a great romp with hidden doors, secret portals, and fast-paced plane hopping, it's got another name that most of the residents call it, the cage. It's called the cage because one person controls the portals and the travel through them. And this person is known only as the mysterious Lady of Pain. Of but course it's a female. Yeah, but she's super badass, and I kind of her. So, like, <laughs> okay, <she's>, good. Yeah, because <laughs> like, if she's just fun as this villain and horrible, blah blah blah, it's like, of course. No, no, no. <laughs> she's she's not a villain at all. Okay, she good. Is, uh, we'll get into her. Okay, <laughs> um, but before we do, let's break down some features of the city. First of all, I want you to picture a large wilderness that sits on a massive disc of like changing distances and size at the center of existence. And this is the Outlands, and we'll talk about them later this episode. But in the middle of this disc is a singular needle of a mountain that is so skinny and so tall, and it is impossibly high. And any attempts to climb it or to fly to the top have failed. It is impossible. And why? Because magic. This mountain is called the Spire. 
and floating above the top of the spire is a torus, a T O R U S. It's not a bull. It is a a uh, think of a massive hollow inner tube um, that houses sigil within it. S uh, take a shot, sigil within it. It's impossible to reach the city from the outside unless the Lady of Pain wants you to. And trying to map size and distance within the city is futile because it's as large as the Lady of Pain wants it to be at any given time. So I want you to think of like a gigantic like donut almost, but the city exists inside of it, um, but uh, it's hollow. So the city actually climbs the walls and the ceiling all the way around throughout the entirety of the donut, right? So... Yes, the city curves up the walls and it defies gravity by existing on all inner surfaces. The time it takes to get from one place to another, the clashing styles of architecture, the placement of locations is ever shifting. There's so much going on in here. There is a very vague and mildly helpful map of major landmarks, but for the most part, it's nearly impossible to define the layout of the city and only specific residents will, get, will have a handle on some sections of it. Additionally, there are a handful of special weirdnesses. There's day and night, but there's no sun or moon. Just peak and anti-peak is what they call it. Peak being the brightest part. When the sky, which is to say the central open space in the center of the inside of the donut, um, when that becomes just brighter, casting shadows like a sun would, and then it dims on a 24-hour cycle because, of course, it is. Um, gravity works in a way where objects fall towards the nearest ground. And remember, grounds the ground goes up and around, right? So uh, the weather is fairly moderate most of the time, but there's a dense fog that clings to the ground some of the time. And you actually can roll to see how dense it is, and it can be thoroughly obscuring. Banishment, plane shifting, astral projection, and other spells don't work in here. But extra-dimensional spaces like your bag of holding are okay. You can teleport within the city, but not across the threshold, so you can't go in or out with teleportation. There are some established teleportation circles in the city, which will allow you to leave, um, but if you try to make your own new one, it will automatically fail, and the Lady of Pain controls the ones that exist. If you try to summon anyone or anything, like I want to talk to a fairy or I want to summon a devil, the summoning does not actually get people from outside, it can only summon creatures or objects within Sigil. And if there's no option, the summoning spell fails. So if you want to uh, Ifridi and you go to summon it and there's not one in Sigil, nothing happens. If there is one, you will pull him from his day job and he will show up mad as fuck. Because nobody can leave without the Lady of Pain saying so. And she is her own unique force of nature. But let's look at the rest of the people first. We find some interesting dichotomies and contradictions here. Um, as far as anyone can tell, humans were the first to inhabit Sigil, and some say that this might even be the original birthplace of humanity in the multiverse. But now it's filled with powerful creatures who are just trying to live their best lives. And I do mean powerful. While we do have your standard playable races or species, as they're going to be called, you also have these people. They, and keep in mind, they all exist within the city, and which means they have to have day jobs. They have to have... They have to interact and contribute to society in some way. This includes hags, um, evil angels, good fiends, genies working the bar, right? We've got brazenly bold agents of gods, both good and evil. Ogres and umber hulks pull like love seats on wheels through the streets and act as taxis for people. There are tour guides and translators of all types who know the city better than almost anyone else, but only a small section of it themselves. There are also cranium rats, which are, if you don't know, I don't think Mieka does. We don't play with cranium rats very often. Casey, do you, are you familiar with them? Okay, no. they're hyper-intelligent rats with clear skulls so you can see their brains, and they are psychic. Hmm. Um, they have like a psychic citywide network of communication uh, beneath the streets, and they're actually a hell of a nuisance. Um, but there's no gods, no arch devils, no demon lords. No deities of any kind are allowed in. And the most powerful being in the city is the Lady of Pain. So, okay, maybe I do like her. <laughs> she has locked down Sigil to not allow any other deities or anyone equal to or more powerful than she is inside it. So it, this is her city. And as far as I can tell, she never leaves it. 
The Lady of Pain is the eternal entity who oversees and protects Sigil. She also protects its passageways to and from and the people within. Now, she seems human at first glance, but she absolutely clearly isn't. She dresses in a large, floating, flowing red dress with gold detailing. It has a long train and layers upon layers of drapery hanging from her thin frame, but they all like float and hover and move with her. She also has a mask, which means that no one knows what she looks like because this bronze mask covers her entire head, including her eyes and her neck, and all the way down to like a chest plate. And so when she moves, she can like turn her head a little bit, but kind of like Batman does in those latest movies, which is like a little turn of the head, but it's mostly shoulders and whatnot. She's very regal looking. The mask also seems to be a part of the dress, and it has a large headdress attached to it that's also made out of bronze that flares out in like a giant, like classical, like halo looking thing. Um, but it has blades sticking out of it in all directions as well and gives her an incredibly intimidating presence. She refuses anyone who tries to worship her and she maintains absolute cosmic neutrality as she hovers around the city and wields power akin to gods. She's backed up by a medium-sized or by medium-sized neutral celestials who float around like she does. They look like demons and they have the disinterested demeanor of stuffy butlers. Um, and so, but they are kind of like um, Ebony Ma a little bit, but not evil from the um, Avengers Endgame. So they're just kind of float around and and decree and enforce her will, right? She has the ability, if she so chooses, to flay you alive with a thought. She could also send you to demiplanar prisons called the mazes or banish you outright. And the mazes are each a facsimile of an ever-repeating labyrinth of the alleyways and streets of Sigil, where you don't require food, drink, or sleep, but there's no life to be found, and the Lady of Pain watches you endlessly. So you are just alone in a maze of the empty city. Generally speaking, you don't mess with the Lady of Pain, because she also has the ability to fill you with excruciating pain and drop you to a single hit point just for speaking to her, and that's her warning shot. The fifth ed material states outright that she has no stat block because she is like a god and cannot be defeated by normal conventions. How do we feel about the Lady of Pain now? She's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that she's like, she rules over, she looks after her people, but then also she's like, don't worship me. Don't like bow to me. Fuck that shit. Stop. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> she, I feel like she's completely obsessed with the concept of pure neutrality and balance across the cosmos and so she's not bringing law and she's not bringing chaos she's bringing balance and so in that state she's almost like an all-knowing all-powerful custodian of this area and an overseer and a jailer and uh and uh like judge jury and executioner like there's so much going on with her we get maybe two pages about her it, it's not enough she's so fucking neat but i do love how mysterious she is now, I mentioned before that the factions don't really exist anymore. There were all these factions. They had a big faction war and whatnot. Um, and that's according to D&D history. But 5th edition likes to play fast and loose with history and timelines. So the factions do still technically exist. But I'd hazard to say that they're a little lesser in power than they once were. And they don't seem like they're ready to pop off and go to war. Most of the factions follow a very simple structure. You take one of the planes and you focus on the philosophies that make up the details and general alignment of that plane. For example, limbo, which is just pure chaos. Until a bunch, uh, then you unite a bunch of people from across the cosmos who all have similar philosophies, beliefs, and alignments, and they've all ended up in Sigil. You put them in a group, you give them some common goals, a function within the city, and then you give them a single leader whose title is Factol. And now, recruit as many people as you can. This is how the factions work. There are 12 main factions called Ascendant Factions who wield the most power. There, I, there are a bunch of them. I grabbed three really quick examples. There's the Bleak Cabal, who are nihilistic healers that believe that there is no meaning to life and the multiverse is a cruel place. So they try to bring comfort, healing, and peace to those in pain. There's the, can you just imagine the most depressed nurses and priests of all time? Like I fucking love that. There are the Heralds of Dust, who believe everyone is already dead. Its numbers are made up of undead, the grieving living, 
and those whose businesses revolve around death, like corpse collectors and undertakers. There's the Society of Sensation, which is made up of artists and entertainers and professional partiers who live in the moment and embrace the now, trying to experience as much as they can so they can learn new truths about reality and life and the meaning of life through sensations, emotions, philosophies, thoughts, everything else they can interact with. And then there are minor factions. But by the way, I picked three of 16. So there's lots of them. Um, when it comes to the minor factions, there's only a handful of them. Fifth edition doesn't spend too much time with them. So I'm not going to even really glance off them. They exist. There's a handful. It's There's lots of stuff in the multiverse is, I guess, the point. So yeah. it kind of reminds me of, of Ravnica and like yeah. just how there's so many different options you can do in there. This kind of gives that same vibe. As yes, you know, the the Ravnica guilds, the way that they break them down, if you were going to focus on a faction or two, I would pick up the Ravnica book and look at how they handle the guilds, and then I would build up a faction in the same way, right? Yeah. You kind of their template. So, um, because there's some information, but not lots. So the last thing I want to talk about with Sigil is the wards. And this is just essentially a series of six defined districts that people can explore. The wards don't make up the entire city, from what I can tell, but there's a decent little blurb on each of them. And you have to remember, it's as large or as small as the Lady of Pain wants it to be, which means these wards don't have definitive boundaries. Like there could be like a pub on the edge of the ward, and that pub will always be on the edge of the ward, but that ward might grow or shrink or have extra blocks, or it might take three hours to walk down one single street to get to the pub. Like, It'll always be there, but it's ever shifting at the same time. Um, the best way that I think about it is if you were to like pop a balloon and you know it's stretchy and you can move it and you put a bunch of dots on the balloon, those dots are always where they are, but you can now stretch the reality in any dimension you want and it's going to change the geography, right? That so. is mentally draining. <laughs> yes. So like, like if you are navigating through all of that in like if you have a campaign and people moving through your party moving oh my god as a dm be like my brain hurts so much <laughs> i think this is going to have two real impacts on a dungeons and dragons campaign for the most part i would generally kind of ignore it except to say it took you 15 minutes longer than it did last time to get to the whatever right but it allows you to open up or close off spaces for narrative purposes and pacing yeah. at the DM's discretion, which is phenomenal. And I really like that. But it also means that you have to rely on certain NPCs like these tour guides to be able to help you through areas. And it'll give you the opportunity to um, to interact with the Lady of Pain's you know, henchmen who will probably be privy to why things are currently in the state that they're in and like you you can go this way but we're making a little bit longer today as a punishment for the parade that was put on yesterday right like shit like that right and so there are narrative purposes and pacing purposes but i feel like it's not going to matter a lot of the time right so when we talk about the wards the book outlines a brief description for each ward, notable locations within, a mega structure located within, the factions that are present, and some sample encounters. We don't have time to go through all of them today, so I'll describe them briefly, and then you two can choose one for me to cover. So, there's the Clerk's Ward, which is a clean district of bureaucracy and order, where artists beautify the area and fill it with life, while contracts and rules are drafted behind closed doors. So both chaos and order. The Hive Ward is mostly ignored by the agents of the Lady of Pain and lies in disrepair and squalor. It's your poor district. Crime runs rampant. Rain falls more often on the cracked streets and crooked alleyways. And there's always an opportunity for some extra legal activities for those who want to explore that side of d, &D. The Ladies Ward is named after the Lady of Pain and it's where you find wealth and influence even though she doesn't reside there or seem to give a fuck about it at all, it's where, like, nobility lives. The high society, religious temples, and fancy balls also hide the wheelings and dealings of the powerful and the corrupt from nobility to crime lords. The lower ward 
is the dreary industrial district full of smog from factories, refineries, forges, and workshops. This is where people who like to create things like artificers tend to congregate. But it gets the name because of the sheer number of portals down here to the lower planes. So there's going to be a lot of fiends down here. The market ward is exactly what it sounds like. It's where merchants and the middle class go to make their living. And deals are made with a thousand kinds of currencies, favors, and barterings. And finally, there's Undersigil, which is known as the Realm Below. The Lady of Pain doesn't care much about what happens in Undersigil, and she has ultimate power there still, but she doesn't wield it really. For the most part, it's made of tunnels, sewers, catacombs, substructures of buildings, and other infrastructure that supports the city above. Entrances to get down here are hard to find, although some of the tour guides will know where some of them are, uh, but monsters and criminals roam Undersigil freely. So, any one of those stand out to, to the two of you? Well, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where you are not necessarily, or where you cannot necessarily easily get to is always intriguing, and where shady shit goes on, so under Sigil. That's Mika's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, the nobility one. Ladies Ward? Yeah, I knew it when I said it. <laughs> I kind of assumed that was going to be Mieka's jam as well. All like... right, um, roll off, <laughs> roll initiative, and I'll cover each one very, very briefly before we move on. Oh my god, three, eight. I'm switching dice. Fuck this. <laughs> All right, going first with an eight. Uh, the quote here is It's the ladies' ward, not the ladies' ward, which is to say, ladies, L A D Y apostrophe S, it belongs to Lady of Pain, not the ladies' ward. So it's not just for ladies. So this is elegant. It's distinguished. There are masked balls and private banquets. Um, we have a D8 table of uh, encounters. I'm going to roll one really quickly. We got a four. A uh, desperate commoner from a faction of your choice has an impending trial in the high courts of Sigil, um, which is one of the locations in this ward. Unable to secure an advocate, they plead with the characters to represent them in court. Um, so yeah, hard. <laughs> um, there are four factions that are headquartered here in the ladies' ward. There's the Doom Guard. Uh, okay, I've got to I've got to jump back and forth here for a second as I tell you what all these mean. The Doom Guard is um, essentially those that celebrate destruction and decay. There is my God. There's so many things to click on here. The Fraternity of Order, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. The Harmonium, which is, uh, these are the people that enforce peace through might and strength only. Their emblem is a gigantic sword, so that gives you pretty much everything that you're going to need there. Um, and then there is the Mercy Killers, which is a hell of a name. And the Mercy Killers are those who bring justice to the deserving. These are bounty hunters, executioners, vigilantes not actual like peacekeepers right so and so these are all located with the high nobility which is a bit of a fun dichotomy and you start to get a lot of that when you look deeper into the themes of planescape in general is that it's very very nice and pretty and wonderful but it's also got this uh, scheming underbelly it's where law is made but the artists are outside kind of gave, gives me like a dc feel in the clerk's ward right like um, but then we get into the locations, and the locations are fun. You have an armory, including something called the Forge of Doom, which is a colossal forge that dominates the first floor of the armory. And then um, beyond the forge lie four heavily guarded chambers, each containing a portal to a fortress on the edge of one of the inner planes, which is fire, water, air, and earth, right? Um, and that's where they house the four Doom Lords. There's a barracks, um, and uh, Fortune's Wheel, which is an extravagant casino, is here as well. That has the Dragon Bar and some Platinum Rooms that only a few know about. There's Heart's Fire, which is a gigantic sparkling temple that are devoted to gods of fire, truth, and light. There are a number of, of temples in this area as well. There's the High Courts, which is where they're essentially exactly you imagine with the courthouse, but it's a gigantic courthouse that's this dignified edifice hewn from flawless white marble with towers that rise from the structure's bladed 
Gables. Like there's so much going on with each one of these. And then we get the infinite well. Ominous chants echo in the infinite well, a temple to the abyss and its untold layers. So the infinite well is quite literally chaotic, evil sound screaming up from it, right? Because there are infinite layers to the abyss, there are infinite demon lords among those um, to be venerated here. As a result, the cultists of the temple are a disorganized mess and daily sacrifices sourced from among the faithful cause their numbers to dwindle. So they're always trying to convert new members to their fold and fanatics of the infinite well don insincere smiles to prove unflinchingly positive as they evangelize in public. And then we have the prison. The prison is a single grim blemish of gray stone and metal that rises above Sigil's resplendent courthouses. There are cells that are engineered to contain all manner of planar convicts, and the prison cells are um, very, very different depending on which block that you're on. There are cellars underneath where they torment rebellious inmates, and uh, you can roll a D12. Do either of you have a D12 right in front of you? Yep. All right, Casey, give me a D12 roll. Five. Five. There is a, what is this guy? A celestial that has killed a formal or a former leader of a faction to preserve the balance, and he is held inside the prison here. So there's information on um, the different wardens, which includes an archon, which is a like militarized angel, a blue dracolich, a mind flayer, and a, a large fiend as well. Uh, that's accompanied by a rabid pack of hellhounds. That's what you got with the ladies ward, Mieka. So as much as there's all of this shit about how it's fun and nice and splendid and everything's pretty, there's some darkness going on in, in the depths, right? Yeah, I guess we can assume like uh, where I will be. In the- <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly where you're going to be. Oh, you're going to you're going to be dragged down into the depths of the prison by the rest of the party, right? <laughs> no. The whole way. No. <laughs> <laughs> you could Our, play like uh many many sessions just in this ward oh yeah like it's like that's a whole campaign potentially of adventuring that's but so- unfortunately it's two pages of info that's it oh man <laughs> yeah the summarization i just did each sentence is about uh, uh, sums up three or four sentences like maybe a half a paragraph there's all sorts of inspiration no lore right uh, hmm. so let's check out under sigil sigil fuck do a shot under sigil <laughs> so we've got um oh god where do we even start with this <laughs> uh, under sigil is um like i said it's the realms below it's the sewer area right so there's a d6 table for encounters and includes like a night hag cranium rats uh so who again right um my favorite one though is you, this is an encounter you can get. A warm sponge cake cools on a dusty stone ledge. Its sweet strawberry aroma wafts through the otherwise dingy passage. A note reading, do not eat, rests below the porcelain serving dish. That's the encounter. <laughs> that I know at our table, that would you guys would spend 25 minutes fighting with Dan and Charlie about this one. Yeah. yeah. And then in 25 minutes, Mieka would lose her patience and then just eat the fucking thing to prove a point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that tracks so so there are a number of different locations here uh the first one that they get into are the dead nations which is an expanse of derelict necropolises and forgotten tombs uh that are just that fill up the catacombs and the the crypts down here there's a decrepit monarch called the silent king that presides over the dead nations and their undead populace there's also the drowned nations which is where the sewers converge and a flooded expanse of rank lukewarm reservoirs and swampy tunnels connect everything there's an enormous drain that's linked to the elemental plane of water that rests in the depths here and it is consistently clogged with some amount of planar garbage and trash there are kuatoa troglodytes sahuagins and an abolith down here you also have the loop even under Sigil has portals, and the worst of them dump their quarries into the loop. The region is a graveyard for the lost, closed circular tunnel connected to dozens of one-way hidden portals scattered throughout Undersigil. 
At first glance, the loop appears no different from the other tunnels that pour into it. However, after repeatedly passing the same doom-filled messages scrawled into its walls, travelers often begin to panic. There's also a place called Nowhere. When a faction falls apart or Sigil tolerates it no longer, its members can join the ranks of another faction, abandon the city entirely, or flee to Nowhere. This is a ramshackle tenement that lies deep in the bowels of Undersigil, and it's where criminals and stubborn believers who refuse to renounce their allegiances live out their pathetic, horrible lives. Um, there are cakers and uh, anarchists and deniers down here. Um, there's an area called Warrens of Thought. The Warrens of Thought are a maze of dripping catacombs beneath the hive. They are home to the largest cranium rat collective in Sigil, which is called the Us. Occasionally called many as one by its multitude of were-rat thralls, the hive mind's combined intellect rivals that of a god. If the us was ever connected to an elder brain, the psychic link has, uh, uh, if, if it was, that psychic link has uh, long since been severed. And now they've been left to their own devices, and they've evolved into a neural network that grows in influence with each passing day. So, super rats. Yeah. That's what we have in Undersigil. Again, tons of inspiration. How am I going to use this in a campaign? I've got to do all the heavy lifting myself, right? Yeah. I like to be able to open up, like, a, like, depending on where the players are, they can accidentally create a entranceway into Undersigil where, like, say they just decide to, I don't know, blow something up as players do. And then suddenly there's this hole in the floor in like the the store that they just blew up or I don't know, an apothecary. Sometimes people blow up apothecaries <laughs> by accident. <laughs> Speaking from experience, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so then you suddenly drop down and you're like, you hear you're in like the sewers and you hear rats and you assume, oh, OK, nasty. But then those are not normal rats. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, it's cool. You you do love the phrase, but then it turns out they're not normal rats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's grab our dice. I want to roll initiative. A couple of questions each. 12. 15. Oh, 17. I Jesus, me, you're five. on fire. Apparently. <laughs> All right. What inspires you the most about Sigil? I love, oh my goodness. It's, it seems like it's a very, for lack of better words, simple place and like kind of like a simple layout, but there's just so much going on, like on the inside that it's just, it's very interesting to me. Like the Lady of Pain, love her, mm-hmm. would like to play, um, you know, as her as a DM or against her as a player. Well, maybe not as a player. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to like, you know, just get into that lore. And of course the, um, I don't know, there's just so many parts to this place that I just want to like explore, especially like the balls and the parties and nobility and yeah. stuff like that. It's a lot to build off of. Like, I know you don't like the fact that it's not much that they give you in terms of the lore, but like, I don't, like if you have a creative mind, you can just go with oh. it. Oh, there's tons to go off for lore. There's just no tools for a dungeon master. Right, right, right. That part really sucks. <laughs> yeah, um, the thing that inspires me the most about this is um, going to be exploring the fact that there are portals everywhere and people seem to be able to come in, but they can't go out. Sound familiar, guys? That's that's literally the shtick of our campaign. Portals <laughs> dropping everybody in. Oh, yeah. I was about to say, wait, where have I heard this before? (laughs) (laughs) So, Casey, uh, what inspires you the most about Sigil? Sigil. Fuck, take a shot. (laughs) Oh, man. I I like that we have a situation with neutrality and all of these different races and types of creatures that you may assume your interaction is going to go one way and then it doesn't because nothing is actually what it seems. I think that's cool. Like as a DM to play around with that where, okay, you're walking down the street and then suddenly there's some, someone managing the traffic and wants you to stop. And then you see like some sort of giant creature, like an orc pulling a, (laughs) 
like a couch on wheels going by and there's I don't know some other bizarre creature two creatures sitting on the couch like having a conversation while they go by and you're just like what the fuck this <laughs> this really does feel like it's like the most multicultural melting pot and while yeah. everybody has all of their powers like their alignments have all been thrown out the window because they've they're trapped and they've got to just live their life here right there's yeah. no opportunity to leave to go do the great good or evil that you want to do right yeah like there could be this like terrifying looking fiend and you're just like oh gosh what's what, <laughs> like we're screwed and then they're like you know the blackjack player a uh, like dealer <laughs> yeah right like it, it's absolutely <laughs> it's absolutely that kind of shit all the way through I want to ask, Mick, would you rather be a DM or a player in Sigil? Oh, player. I, player. yeah. Why? Um, Because I want to get up the shit. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the fucking truth? God damn. Um, I, I want to be a player here. I want to explore it. I don't want to do the heavy lifting. There's so much cool shit to dig into. And as much fun as I would have, like, driving down the road in my personal life and daydreaming about what shit's going to be in the, like what kind of merchants are in the market ward and shit like that. Like that's a lot of fun for me. The pressure that I would feel to add so much detail because you cannot escape the urban setting. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, I have done a lot of urban setting stuff in our campaigns and I've, I'm comfortable with it. I don't want to have to do it. Right. And so with the exception of going into the the darkness and under sigil, you're not going to you're not able to really explore wilderness. Right. So your random encounters are back alleys or, you know, casinos. And while these are interesting, you, like I'm, am I, I'm never going to get a boat. Right. And so I don't want to DM that. I'd rather be a player exploring that and having it kind of given to me. Yeah, I think it gives. Hmm. Hmm. I think I would like to be the DM to be up to this challenge because it would push your role playing because you aren't ha getting to describe a whole different like um, environment or you're on the road. Uh, like that would be maybe what I would miss as a player is the <laughs> random encounters being on the road and traveling to a certain place where you're in the wilderness, then you might be in the water, then you might be going encountering a uh, like village or something. Mm -hmm. But this would playing in this as it like if you were or no if you were a dm it would be all of the you would have so many npcs and it would be creating the characters for all of those npcs and heavy role playing and so if you want to really work on that part this is a great setting for that so i think that would push my boundaries on making myself a better role player coming up with new new voices and <laughs> and you would need so many yeah and then it would it would allow the like the piece of you know you'd have different stores and you'd have the market and all of that but that would be more simple to prep and plan because you wouldn't have to think about maps like complicated maps of like the world it's just okay we're in this ward I can even stick to this ward for like the foreseeable future for my party. Decide where those those main locations are. And then everything in between is just, yeah, streets and alleyways or rooftops or whatever you want to be. Yeah. But then you can focus on the other one. So I would need months to prep before this campaign started, but I think I would want to DM it. I will say this, though. It is so vague that you can pretty much do whatever you want. But I think that I would definitely be buying shit on DMs Guild to flesh this out. And and I would be in the wikis getting as much details as I could. So, mm -hmm. But let's jump over to the Outlands, which is I talked very briefly about. And I know that we're getting a little bit long in the episode, so I'm going to try to be a little bit briefer on the Outlands. Although there's a lot going on here as well. The Outlands is a vast, fluctuating wilderness of true neutrality. But that doesn't mean that it's boring. What it actually means is that there are 16 different biomes and landscapes that each embody the alignment and geography of a different plane from the Great Wheel cosmology. So the landscape of Pandemonium can be seen from the peaks of mountains like Mount Celestia. The landscape of the Abyss is near to a biome similar to Mechanus. So 
imagine it's almost like I think they did this in like one of the um, Alice in Wonderland movies where you just suddenly cross a threshold and you're in an entirely different environment. And each one of these environments is a reflection of one of these planes of existence. However, the Outlands is neutral. If a portion of the Outlands begins to act, look, and function too much like one of the planes, then that part of it um, is absorbed by the plane into the plane itself, and a new area of the Outlands manifests to, man to maintain the balance. So if the area for the Abyss gets too chaotic evil, then it will just become a part of the Abyss, and, a, and the Outlands will manifest a new area to represent the abyss because it has to keep it in balance while sigil doesn't allow gods any entrance the outlands welcome gods and their followers and some specific gods have homes here like anum the all father of the giants in his hidden tower so in the entire giant series you guys are wondering where anum was he's been in the outlands what other beings are free to worship, trade, and live their lives how they see fit. Some actively try to oppose the influence of alignments and keep the balance stable, while others are looking to tip the scales and send sections of the vast landscapes into other planes so they can escape. You can expect all manner of humanoid and creature in this ever-changing uh, series of landscapes, and you may hear any language in any part of this realm where distances are ever-changing and travel times are completely subjected to the Dungeon Master's whim that is written in the material. It's up to you as a DM to figure out how much time you want to spend in each area because it's always moving as uh, there are more cultists for the Nine Hells over here. That's greater influence. So, so Elysium might grow an extra 17 miles just to balance off the amount of influence in the area. All right, so... The other notable thing is that the Outlands act as a true crossroads between the planes. While Sigil, the city of doors, is on constant lockdown, the Outlands themselves are pretty open for travel for the most part. Remember how I said that there are 16 different sections? That number is specifically 16 because that's how many gates there are, each to one of the planes. Generally speaking, although it's subject to change because of the shifting landscape, these gates are generally close to the perimeter of this disc world and roughly evenly spaced from each other. So if you were to take like a large disc and just draw 16 equally distant spots around the perimeter of it, that's where the gates are. But the interior is always shifting in size and distance, which again, if you take the stretchy balloon, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, but it is a little mind bending. Each one of the gates has a small town that has slowly popped up around it. And it's these established gate towns that most strongly resemble the planes on the other side of the portals. The book points you to the DMG for info on the planes, but that's not fucking helpful. And it doesn't give you a whole lot of information about the planes themselves at all in the goddamn Planescape fucking book. <laughs> You're not going to rant. We don't have time. I'm moving on. The gate towns are in, in alphabetical order, I'm going to read them out to you. Remember, each one of them connects to a different plane of existence in the Great Wheel. And then we're going to roll initiative to discuss a couple of them. You guys are going to roll, and we're going to figure out which one. So uh, here, here's what they're called. Automata, Bedlam, Cursed, Ecstasy, Excelsior, Faunal, Fortitude, Glorium, Hopeless, Plague Mort, Ribcage, which is, I think, my favorite, Rigis, Sylvania, Torch, Tradegate, and Jouse. So that's a lot. But every one of those is, even the like nonsense words are like an evocative name for this gate town that has like, that is around this gate that leads away. And the gates are um, two way gates. You can come and go essentially as you please, but I think there are rules for some of them as well. So anyway. Um, let's roll initiative, just you two. We'll see who's going to go first. Nine, two. All right. So Casey, you're first. And instead of trying to ask you to remember what they're all, what they all are, can you roll 3d6? Cause that actually yeah. gives us 16 options. So roll 3d6 and subtract two from your roll. And that'll give us which one. Okay. Math. Okay. Nine. All right. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You chose hopeless. Great. <laughs> this is 
directly related to the gray waste of Hades, which is going to be one of your um, lawful evil places, right? Um, the primary citizens are all humanoids, which is not true of all gates. Uh, and the idea here is that we've got a dreary town that has a single entrance through a gate that looks like a big, like, like fiend mouth. And like even the, the entrance to this massive gate is, is like teeth all the way around, like big metal teeth. The residents of Hopeless are gloomy as fuck. They're defeated with nowhere else to go and no energy to leave. They dress in drab, monotonous garments devoid of color or fashion. And they are, it says, they trudge listlessly down the gate town's single curving avenue like sewage to a drain. <laughs> wow. Right? <laughs> so um, there's a high cardinal here. Uh, she is Cardinal Thingol. And she was once a mage of a dying world. While others spurn, uh, and some people believe this, other people don't. And uh, they don't think that she's immortal at all. And she's just um, there to be a glimmer of hope that flickers among the townsfolk. Um, because she floats through Hopeless, adorned in a, an expressionless iron mask and a robe of rattling chains. The unfeeling tyrant's laws change by the day, but her disdain for color and emotion are consistent. She is a joyless executioner who um, compounds the sorrow of her subjects. The gate itself is in the center of a pit with this big circular courtyard where a bottomless well bubbles with thick black gunk. Creatures who enter the squelching reservoir, which is known as the wishless well, show up in Hades covered in sticky tar. So the gate is, is prone to overflowing, oozes, eugaloths, and liquefied um, fiends gurgle to the surface and pour over the edge. There are some regional effects. Lingering apathy. The residents of hopelessness are cheerless and indifferent, which means that charisma checks are made with disadvantage for performance and persuasion. Wasting pigments. Hopelessness leeches the color from its inhabitants. Skin, scales, fur, they all fade to gray. Non-magical clothing and equipment just become ashen in tone. There are some noteworthy sites of this uh, gate town as well, including the Castle of Bone, which is uh, seen over by a neutral good white. Were you guys both on the whites episodes of the undead? There's a neutral good one. And he has a modest staff of neutral skeletons. There's the gallows, where townsfolk that are suspected of crimes are allowed to be accused and uh, given the chance for salvation. Um, but that salvation comes with an execution. So, And then there's the Tomden Manor, where the dead dance in a haunted mansion at the end, at the edge of town. Uh, lots of wraiths and specters, will-o'-wisps are on the grounds and whatnot. There is a D4 table for adventure hooks here. I'm just going to pick one at random. High Cardinal Thingold hires the characters to catch the Jester, a costume vigilante in possession of a wand that spreads joy. I love it. So, so that's fun and interesting. I love this. I wish we had a map. I wish there were stat blocks for unique creatures here. I wish that we had a little bit more about what's on the other side of the fucking portal. But we have none of that. So, yeah. Again, flavorful, interesting, good lore. I need help, right? Mieka. <laughs> Roll 3d6 and subtract 2. Go with math. 6. 6. Faunal, which is the gate that leads to the wilderness of the beast lands. <laughs> the primary citizens here are awakened beasts. So animals of all kind with intelligence and language. The faunal that the Outlands once knew is gone. Its roar so mighty that the gate town was absorbed by the beast lands. And now the, tone, or the town has to start anew. It's been reestablished by newcomers and stragglers and sapient animals who were away when the home disappeared. They came back and found their town gone. There's lush veg uh, vegetation that are growing out of the like cracks and the crumbling bits of the ruins that are left behind. There's grasping vines that are tugging at travelers who try to make their way through. And beasts are slowly returning to Faunal, but who among them will rise to the top of the food chain? There's not a ruler yet. We do, however, have a saber-toothed tiger named Ebon Claw, an elephant named Ophelia, and a giant eagle named Parvaz. And they are all potentially going to be the leader. The gate itself is um, a tranquil pool at the foot of a stone statue. The pool's waters replicate the effect of an awakened spell. 
Beasts that lap from its crystalline waters find their tongues capable of speech, and saplings weaned on the reservoir eventually uproot as wooden guardians that defend the town. If you submerge yourself, then you will emerge in the untamed wilds of the Beastlands, which is one of the chaotic good um, planes of existence, which is just, it's just a wild hunting ground, right? So there's a stone colossus that kneels before the pool at the town center, its weathered visage and mossy limbs reflecting the pool's sparkling ripples. Um, it's called Wrath by the animal kingdoms that came before it, and the Guardian questions all who seek the portal, asking whether they hunt for sport or sustenance. The Titan alone decides who may enter and who must meet a gruesome end. There's a little bit more information on Wrath, but there's a bunch of regional effects as well, including the fact that there's all sorts of awakened beasts in this area and a tropical paradise where frequent rainfall yields fruit and water in abundance. Survival checks to forage are made with advantage. Some of the noteworthy sites are Camp Greenbrier, which is a spiked wooden palisade that lines the perimeter of, uh, sorry, there is a spiked wooden palisade that lines the perimeter of Camp, of camp Greenbrier. Um, and it's an assembly of tents and little like primitive huts and whatnot, mud-soaked caravans. Uh, that have ended up here and they are uh, it's just like a safe haven there's a friendly three-toed sloth named razak who likes to hang out around the camp and so he acts kind of like as a messenger for the uh, little splinter kingdoms that are sh that are popping up for each one of the potential rulers there's the eagle's airy as well um which is what you can expect that that's where your eagle ruler is going to be um, there's the Razor Tooth Rock, which is where Ebon Claw, which is a saber tooth tiger, uh, is going to hang out. It's an ideal place for snakes and other big cats. So like, a lot of predators in that area. Then we have a little a little section of uh, adventures here on a little chart. So again, I'm going to pick one at random. An irate rock assails Eagle's Airy, gobbling up its inhabitants and destroying their nests in search of its egg, which was stolen in a vile hunt. So if you remember, rocks are gargantuan creatures that are hawks essentially that block out the sun, right? So they this is a this is a big deal. So Mieka, it's about as close to camping as you're probably ever gonna be. How does that feel? <laughs> I'm not a fan of this place, but a lot the, going on. The um you don't want to talk to Anne, you don't want to be Dr. Doolittle? No. I want to go back to the uh to a uh, Sigil. Is it Sigil? <laughs> Single yeah. in the ladies' ward. Yeah, that's where I want to be. <laughs> um, there is a small fact that is given here in a quote. On average, it takes a sloth 30 days to digest a single leaf. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> Fun fact of the day, I guess. I'm glad we spent ink on that and not GM tools. <laughs> uh, oh, what you actually need. <laughs> yeah. So there are actually other realms in the Outlands that are small sections of, of different unique areas where some of these powerful creatures, like I mentioned, they're gods and stuff. They've kind of carved out little, little areas for themselves. Um, and these are features there. There are 18 different ones that are listed very, very briefly. They'll get like a paragraph, maybe two. Um, and there are things like walking castles, evil layers of immortal beings or havens of gods. Um, there really is a short blurb for each of them. I'll read them all out afterwards, but I'd like you guys to um, keep the same initiative, but this time roll 2d10 and subtract one so that we get 18 options. We'll just re-roll 20s so that we have 18 options because there's 18 of these weird little unique points on the map. So Casey, what do you get? 2d10 minus one. I rolled 20, which never, I, it never happened. So 19. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. The, I need you to re-roll. We re-roll 20s on this. Even? Really? There's only 18 <laughs> options. There is no option 19. <laughs> oh, my God. This is always how it goes. Yeah. I will never roll that again. Okay. Now I got um, uh, um, 14. 14. The Spire. So this is actually that big mountain at the very center, right? Underneath the uh, underneath Sigil. Take, take half a shot. I nearly fucked it up. Um, the spire. I'm just going to read it out loud because it's very, very short. The spoke at the center of the great wheel. The spire is an infinitely tall pinnacle of rock that towers above the outlands. Above its highest point hovers the city of Sigil, its streets lining the inside of a floating torus. Pockets of anti-magic radiate from the spire. Though the gate towns and most realms in the outlands are beyond its reach, the spire's intermittent magic dampening effect 
is enough to bring archmages to their knees and reduce gods to mortals. Still, some creatures eke out an existence near the spire, and others, such as Romani, thrive in its shadow, seemingly immune to nullifying properties. I don't know what Romani is. Uno momento, por favor. Uh, real many are powerful embodiments of pure neutrality. They're humanoids. They appear humanoid. Their skin looks metallic and their eyes emit a pearly light. Uh, they're capable of polymorphing into almost any humanoid. But they're pretty aloof and standoffish. So there you go. Um, it says that it makes gods mortal. That right there is a fucking plot hook. Yep. <laughs> um, Mieka, can you roll? Uh, 12. Okay, 12. Uh, the realm of the Norns. We're going to find out what the fuck this means. Fates are spun and severed in the realm of the Norns, a community of seers who divine meaning from mystical signs across the plains. Okay, so you've got the diviners. That's cool. Uh, on the horizon looms the sunset-like arch of phenomenally huge spinning wheel that turns endlessly and can never be reached. Locals gather in a few village-sized hubs, but most keep to themselves in private hermitages observatories, and other structures from where they ponder fate's particularities. Many people bearing magical curses also live in the area. While some hunt for ways to end the magic affecting them, most have accepted their condition and live peacefully. The region's best-known inhabitants are a trio of fantastically old, fate-weaving witches who go by many names. The Norns, the Grey, and the Fates among them. So these are your, your Greek fates, right? So... Mm -hmm. um, these seers are said to be able to see any creature's past, future, and true purpose with perfect clarity. However, since many of the realm's residents are aged, reclusive fortune tellers, none know who among them are the actual Norns, if indeed they even exist. Okay. I have used the fates in my campaign more than once. I quite love them, and we I've talked about them on the podcast in the past, so it's cool to me that, there's, that it's present here as well. I'm not going to read off all of them, but you do get other places here like the Court of Light, Caverns of Thought, Flower Hill, uh, or sorry, Flowering Hill. Flower Hill, isn't that where you live? Mieka? Is there a Flower Hill? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, there's a neighborhood called Flower Hill by Mieka. Um, the Valley of the, or sorry, the Vale of the Spine, there are walking castles, Wonder Home, Mausoleum of Cronepsis, Moradin's Anvil, Moradin being the main dwarven god, the Labyrinth of Life, so there are all of these different places. Um, and I think that just as a little way to kick off the end of the episode, the hidden realm. After the decline of giants, Anam, the Allfather, disowned his children and left Isgard, swearing never to answer the prayers of giants again until they restored their ancient kingdom and reclaimed their rightful place as mighty rulers. The Allfather now dwells in the Outlands, his realm hidden from divination magic and invisible to the naked eye. Though the Hidden Realm's location is unknown, divine oracles believe the Father of Giants sits in a crystal tower atop an enormous mountain, silently watching over the multiverse and waiting for his children to rouse from their complacency. Some claim a portal to Anam's fortress lies spyward, or spireward of the Great Pass. So when you go to the Great Pass, which is another one of the places, start moving towards the spire, you might find the Hidden Realm. Cool. So... Again, very neat, very, very flavorful. I love the lore. Give me a fucking map to work with. Tell me what Anam is really doing. Don't say, some believe. That's cool. Now tell me what the truth is so I can play with it, right? Yeah. Anyway, let's roll initiative one last time on the episode. I got a seven. I rolled a one. <laughs> Six. Talking to myself then. Okay. What inspires me the most about the Outlands? Um, the different gate towns are really interesting and flavorful, and I really want to just go on a world tour of them. I feel like if you start off at level four, you could walk your way through the entire campaign going, you know, gate town to gate town and ending up in Sigil at level 20, right? And I would love to do that. But there's so much cool shit. I could honestly spend... Like, if we were to sit down and say, hey, we're going to spend five years just playing in the Outlands, there's so much stuff going on here. There's a lot to, to dig into. And whereas I didn't want to be a DM for a Sigil, I absolutely want to DM all this weird shit that's going to be something new every three weeks, right? Yeah. I love that essentially 
you could let if you were starting a campaign and you had like however many players you had you could give them no limits on what creature what background anything that they ever want to put together as a character and they're is going to be either a direct link to how they built their character in the Outlands or to their backstory. Mm -hmm. So no matter what a player puts together, there will be something in the Outlands that can like be a connection and so that you can do quests based on every player super easy. And it would be really, really fun. (laughs) Yeah, there's something for everyone here. Yeah. Mieka, what inspires you the most about the Outlands? Besides just getting to talk to animals and camping. (laughs) Well, kind of going off of that, I and I guess this is true for like any D and D setting. I feel like here the character development is kind of like can get pretty awesome. Um, like the whole beast uh thing that I chose. Like, think about like the characters you can develop just based off of like talking, <laughs> the talking animals and stuff like that, and also um. I like what you said, Adam, about how you could just play a whole campaign here and just do one of the, you know, um, what was it? Was it 16? There there are 16 gate towns and 18 other realms and then Sigil. There's a lot. Yeah, Yeah, it's a lot to unpack here. So definitely. And imagine, yeah, like what I, what you were talking about, Adam, about leveling up in throughout, like, do like going and exploring everything is like my mind immediately went to like maybe you learn that there is actually a way to get up to Sigil but you re- must acquire um, like 25 different things and it might be knowledge it might be an item but you need to explore the entire thing and acquire all of these these different pieces in order to actually get to Sigil. And by that point, you are leveling as you're finding this stuff. You might have epic battles. You might have to just go and seek out the lore from a loved one who is in the hopeless (laughs) area. Yeah. And, you know, like it would spin dark. It would spin jovial. It would be spin beastly because you're going to talk like someone in your group needs to start talking to animals. Like it, it could just be a whole thing. And I think that's so cool. <laughs> I kind of already answered this for myself about being a DM or a player in the Outlands. I would be a DM. I want to I want to build these things. I want to do the research. It, because the lore is so broad, but so shallow, there's a lot for me to wander around and just have kind of ADHD about and, and get in and just really fucking love something for two sessions and then do a session of random encounters and move on to the next thing, right? Like... I'm, I don't know. I'm I'm a big, big fan of being a DM here. And I would like to be the player in your campaign here because I would totally be the one. I see what's going on here. OK, where are we starting? And then like tracking the the names of all of the places. And it's like, OK, here we acquired this thing <laughs> like, yeah. and we talked to these people in this area. So we need to remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd want to be the player. Player for me, too. I want to get up to shit. <laughs> you don't <laughs> say <laughs> no but like perfect place to like explore and like find new things and oh my gosh we would we would be all over the place casey our, yeah uh, our group <laughs> and one other thing i thought about is what if you actually need to get to say like the abyss and so your only means to doing it is to cause enough chaos so that the the area that you are in in the outlands ends up doing that like like peel off like you you said adam and then joins the abyss and that is your gateway to get to the abyss is you have to then cause enough problem in a region so that it's decided that it needs to be removed to maintain the neutrality and mm-hmm. then it's like boom <laughs> Yeah, that would then be you so have to much. Figure out how to get back, but <laughs> yeah, God, that would be so much fun. All right, well, before we cap off this episode, let's uh, check in with an info break. If you've been inspired by the conversation in this episode, please feel free to reach out and share your creativity and ideas with us and the rest of the community. You can reach us on Facebook and Instagram, or on our subreddit at r slash it's a mimic. 
Also, if you're feeling particularly generous, please follow and subscribe and leave us positive reviews, likes, and comments. Engagement like that helps us pop up on search engines and keep this show running. In all honesty, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely would you be to DM an adventure in this version of Planescape? Casey? It's, I am inspired, but there's so many things that also inspire me, like four. Yeah, if I could be honest, it was just left up to me. I could like a six or a seven. I have made vague promises that once we're done our campaign, um, that uh, and we and like we're going pretty slowly at the moment, and the wedding is going to derail things. So like this is way off, but I have made vague promises that I would like to do a small year long thing in Theros, and a small year long thing in Eberron as well. Um, those will probably be the next actual campaign settings, but I think Planescape. The Outlands and Sigil, that's number three on the list. Even more so than Ravnica for me, which is a big deal. But there's just more going on here in really good ways. Mieka? Uh, three, I feel like this, it, it's a great place for an adventure, but it also comes with great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> we Everyone yeah. just learned a lot about you, Mieka. <laughs> they knew. <laughs> But um, no, honestly, I just see myself being a player in this. I, it's a lot, and it's a, it's great, but you got to put together a lot of pieces here. So fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. I think that any final thoughts on on Planescape or the uh, or Sigil in the Outlands specifically? I'm glad I know about it now. I think. It is a cool thing to, if you're feeling uninspired and you want to take your player somewhere, this could be a fun place to explore. So I'm glad I know more about it. Yeah, same here. I'm I'm pretty happy with what we ended up getting. Um, I wasn't initially, but uh, but I am now. I'm going to share my screen with you guys for just half a second so you can see the Lady of Pain. Oh, yeah. (gasps) Oh, she's scary. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah yeah that nice. floating down like hovering above the street coming towards you right is a is a pretty intimidating situation right like the face too like that just don't... It, it's a completely <laughs> neutral face but it's saying so much mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so i uh i quite like the the lady of pain i quite like uh the entire um the entirety of the planescape that should exist at fifth edition kind of did dirty. They took three steps down the road. The lore, the people that researched the lore on this did an amazing job putting it together. I wish there were details that could be absolutely used um, by people that want to run this. I don't feel like it's enough information. We got, and again, they did this in the Spelljammer campaign as well. We got this book explaining what it is, but it's just enough to allow you to run specifically this one adventure that we want you to run that comes within this book, right? Within the box set. So so here you go. Here's just enough info to support the book, like the adventure, with a couple other extra details. And that's not enough for me. So anyway, that's all for this part of our conversation on Sigil and the Outlands in D&D 5th edition. Please take a second to engage with a like follow, comment, and review to help push our engagement. And don't forget to subscribe to find future inspirations for your campaigns. If you'd like to support us, we have a store with some merch and a donate button on our website, it's mimic.com, as well as a Patreon. This episode and others can also be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, and most other podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. This has been an It's a Mimic production. Please check the show notes for this episode to see links, time codes, and credits. And don't forget to reach out and share your own inspirations. There's one other quick thing that I just want to mention here before we wrap up. Um, So this whole like this whole shit about you uh every action you make has two reactions out in the universe this is bullshit largely until you figure out that it actually matters to characterization 
Um, and when you build a character, you are encouraged to create what's called glitch characters. And the idea is that when you make your character, you have to determine what was the greatest decision or turning point in your character's life, what's something your character wishes they could change about themselves, and what is your character's signature possession or physical trait. And then the DM gets that. And there are now two other versions of your characters out there in the world. And the, you can either bring them in as surprise incarnations um, where they are existing uh, at the same time that they're uh, that the other characters do and they have them um, all like interact with each other. And then if one dies, if the character, the player character dies, they can take over one of the other incarnations. Um, and then uh, you can also like prepare ahead of time as well so that they can like hunt down and find their incarnations and interact with them. Right. So, so there's a lot, a lot going on here. Um, it, it's a neat idea. It's a weird little mechanic to play with. The other weird mechanic in the published storyline is that it takes you from, I think, level three to level like, was it 14 or 15? Or, no, not even that high, 13 maybe. And then suddenly you jump to level 17, like between chapters. You just glitch through the multiverse and show up more powerful at the next thing. And then you finish off at level 20, you level up that last little bit, right? Which is just a weird way to advance the end of the campaign. I don't know if it feels unearned. I don't know if I like it, um, but it's interesting. It's something that I would think about doing, I guess. Do you guys have any opinions on any of that? The, um, I, with the whole like glitch characters, I actually really love that. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that, that can change the game so much. <laughs> It's definitely a spin. It's the it's the what ifs actually coming true or being like more clearly defined and you don't know whether they're actually going to come into play or not. Mm -hmm. And I like that the players may not necessarily know what those questions are all about. It's like, OK, sure, DM, I'll answer these. But it could end up impacting the campaign and their character so massively later on, which is yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. Also, no player would ever dream that they would go from level 14 to 17. So at the end of a session, if, you know, you conclude something and then the DM is like, all right, suddenly, whatever the fuck happens, mind fuck. And then it's like, okay, level up your characters, but level to 17. Like oh, the no, players sorry, sorry. Like, you go from level 10 to 17. It's a huge oh, jump. 10 to 17. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, like to to ask that of your players, if that's what you're actually going to do, it will be like, what is going on? <laughs> Honestly, at that point, like we're going to wrap up the, the chapter 14 of the book. And then the next session, everybody comes over for beer and pretzels. We're just going to sit around and talk and we're going to work together to level characters. Right. Yeah. So that, that we can do the math and make the choices together so that no one's making a character kind of in isolation, like leveling up yeah. that much. And then the next time we'll actually pick up where, where we left off. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Planescape was wild. I was dreading this episode for so long because it's, I didn't know how much I was going to hate what fifth edition had to offer. And I do hate a lot of how they present Planescape, but I really like Sigil and the Outlands. So did you guys end up liking it in the long run or is this going to be easily forgettable? I like the ladies war. <laughs> <laughs> but like I also like I think I like Sigil more than the Outlands, if I can yeah. be honest. I like that urban landscape, like let's we're running through the streets trying to figure out what the hell is going on and like stuff like Lady that. Lady of Pain. Mm hmm It's such a again, I said at the beginning, there's so all these contradictions and dichotomies and things like and we see that with the Outlands being this like vast wilderness of all this crazy shit to do and sigil which is locked down and there's stuff there's adventures to have in there but it is i feel like it's claustrophobic and i don't yeah. mean like in necessarily a bad way just like it feels i mean claustrophobia is not like a good thing like of course it's a bad way but like i don't mean like you shouldn't do it right so i don't know I see it as more as like a one shot, maybe even two shot or three, sh whatever <laughs> shot type of place. I don't, I wouldn't want to play a whole campaign in Sigil. I think, I don't know this for certain, but I think that this area, um, Planescape, is 
one of the key places in the latest book that just came out, the Vecna Eve of Ruin, because you do tons of plane hopping in that. You go to Eberron, you go to, like, and I think you have to go through Sigil to do it. I think that's the thing. I'm not, I know you do go spell jamming at some point, so you're on ships entering through portals and stuff, but I, I think Planescape shows up as well. So it's, you oh. get like one chapter of the story um, or a, like a session or two in Sigil to mess around too, which is pretty cool. Casey, did yeah. you like it? Um, I liked I liked what we covered today a lot. So I think I'd be more inclined to add this book to my collection for not for the sake of completing the collection because I like completing collections. Yeah. But the fact that, oh, I might actually use this book. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to look at it, even if I'm going to do any like plane hopping or something, if I, we ever want to go to, I don't know, any one of the the other planes on the, like the outer planes. I would probably dig into this and look at those gate towns for inspiration and whatnot, but they don't really give us much about the plane itself outside of the DMV. Mm -hmm. So I guess good. It's not great. Um, a Google search is going to be more helpful, I think, in a lot of ways. So anyway, I am going to go over to Dan's house now and steal his chairs. Oh, nice. So that we get rid of these god-awful uncomfortable ones. And the one that I'm sitting in isn't literally on the fucking floor. <laughs> You're just like slowly sinking. <laughs> it's no longer slowly sinking. The freaking piston or whatever it is broke. It, I am my permanently <laughs> ass on the carpet on this fucking chair. My knees are around my ankles. No, my ankles. My knees are around my ears. I am fucking, I hate it so much. My ass goes numb. I'm going to get up and walk around every couple hours or I lose feeling in my toes. It's fucking ridiculous. Anyway, so I'm going to go to Dan's house and steal chairs because he has chairs for me so let's uh let's kick off the episode all right i, I have energy we can do this I, i'm not kidding the sunday morning recordings are the only time of my life where i miss caffeine oh i bet you're doing so well as i as i sit my caffeine yeah <laughs> My my routine after we hit end on and it starts to save, my routine is putting my forehead down on my desk, closing my eyes and just breathing for 30 seconds after every episode just to be able to live. Oh, my God. And then I check my phone and me is blown it up with 400 TikTok links. So. <laughs> the routine. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Why are you still here? Leave already.